Corinthians chapter 5, about the first 10 verses there, and then I've got a few other places I want to go to, but that's our main text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to go look at verses 1 through 10. Of course, the Apostle Paul wrote a good part of the New Testament, and uh, he wrote this, and you know, the largest house, and I don't know if it still is, but for a long time it was the largest house, like, is out in San Jose, California. They started building it in 1890. And this lady thought, well, as long as she was adding building onto her house, she wouldn't die. So she just kept building and adding rooms, you know, because after all, she didn't want to die. Uh, of course, you know, when I was a... Uh, Kids have funny ideas. When I was little, I knew I needed to get saved. I kept putting it off. And I knew the Bible said if you were looking for the Lord to come, He wouldn't come then. He's going to come one way we weren't looking for Him. And uh, so as a kid, I'd pray at night, Lord, I, I think you're coming back tonight. So you, <laughs> He couldn't come that night. Well, I don't know why I didn't just get saved and forget that, you know. Later on, I did it at 11 years old, but uh, it's funny how kids think about things. Yeah. And really, it's kind of hard to tell what's behind those little eyes. <laughs> I, look, I look at Rebecca's and, and uh, Abigail's, you know, and what are they thinking? <laughs> They're thinking something. They're checking everything out. Of course, everything's new to them, just like uh, Jimmy up here. He, Everything's new to him. And so he watches, and that's how they learn it, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I, I got to warn you, they'll watch you. You better not do yes, that. Because they'll copy it. Yes, and, then that, and then you criticize, get on them about doing yeah. what you did. That's right. So if you don't want them to smoke cigarettes, you probably shouldn't smoke right. If you don't want them drinking alcohol, you shouldn't drink it. Or somebody, because you know, you're God put you here to take care of them and to protect them and teach them. I see families all the time, you know, mom and dad and several children walking around, and I, I wonder if they're safe people because what are they going to teach their kids? Yeah, it's pretty important. And those first 10 years are the most important, I believe. It kind of shapes them. And if you wait until they get in their teens, you've probably lost out. Because they're pretty well set in their ways by then. Usually around 11, 12, 13. But we're going to go here. and. But anyway, this lady kept building this house. And uh, she didn't want to die. Uh, Paul said, talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 here. We're going to read some verses. But uh, we're living in a tent. A tent's temporary housing. But I'm going to get a permanent house one of these days. And uh, so we're looking at uh, our text here. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle will dissolve, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Is this the only body you're going to ever have? No, Are you going to get a better one? Well, I'm thankful for this one. I need some place to live. You know, if I didn't have this body, I'd be homeless. <laughs> it's my home for right now. But this is a temporary home. I'm going to get a permanent home. And Paul was a tent maker. So that's why he, I think, talked this way. And he hung around with other tent makers. They probably talked tent. <laughs> uh, you kind of talk about what you're interested in. What was the guy who wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? You know how you do that? Be interested in them and what they are right. into. You got to kind of win them over first. And then you get opportunities to witness to them. Verse 2, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Well, I'd like to get that new body. Anybody here like to get that new body? Well, one guy said, uh, you know, when I wake up in the morning, he said, uh, if I'd wake up and I didn't hurt, I'd think I was dead. Right. 
as you get older, it kind of gets that way, doesn't it? Now, when you're young, you don't have it as bad. Now, verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. I need a body. Of course, we're also clothed in God's righteousness if we're saved. Amen. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. Verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. You're going to get a body that can't die. Amen. Now this body can die. Matter of fact, it will die if Jesus doesn't die. Yeah. Take us out in the rapture. Mm -hmm. But if we live long enough, you, I don't know too many people make it over 100. Yeah. 70 and 80. See, I'm getting up to borrow time now. I'm 75. Psalms 90 talks about 70 by strength 80. Doesn't really go past that. But you had people back in the Old Testament live 900 years. But I think it was a different time and a different, there's a lot of reasons I'm not going to get into that. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Well, you know, God, you know, if you go to buy a house or buy something, you put money down. I, I always irritates me these car dealers. You go on the lot to look at a car to buy a car. Well, the, I've had three people look at this car and if you put a little money down on it. Because yeah. that's the way of getting you to come back. You know, if they get a little of your money. And I, I think they study all the same spiel. And... Uh, but if you buy a house, you put earnest money down to prove you are serious about buying it. Has God put any earnest into us? They put the Holy Spirit in there. Is, is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? Well, for the lost people, this is the best they're going to have. But for saved people, it's going to get better. And so I look forward to getting that new body, a body that won't die. And the Lord's promised me that. He's also given me the earnest of the Spirit here to know that I'm going to get it. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we, not, not, for we walk by faith, not by sight. I haven't seen heaven, but I'm going there. Yeah. I'm walking by faith. And then verse 8, I like this verse. We are confident, I say, and willing rather be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. Are you sure you're saved? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Can you be? Yes, sir. Said conf Paul said he was confident. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive that which things which uh, receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Somebody says, "Well, you, you try and say we have to work our way to heaven, no? But I believe after you get saved, you'll be willing to live and do something for God. Amen. If He loved you enough to die on the cross to pay for you, don't you love Him enough to live for Him?" And that's, that's a pretty simple way of putting it. But you know, a tense, a temporary, unsatisfactory home. Of course, you know, it's not really very solid. and Probably would get a little cold in the wintertime in a tent. Yeah. Wouldn't it? I'd rather have some solid walls and a better home. Now, Paul got caught up to the third heaven, got to see what it would be like when we go to heaven, but he wasn't allowed to tell us a lot about it. So if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, he tells about this experience he has, but he tells it uh, in like the third person, he, like he's talking about somebody else, but I believe he's talking about himself. That's right. And he said this fellow had this experience, and he said, I don't know if he was in the body or out of the body. Now here lately they've been working on my CPAP stuff and I'm sleeping more sound. I've been having more dreams. 
When you don't sleep as sound, you don't dream. That's the truth. I mean, I slept four hours in the bed last night. Had a hard time getting my, I'm trying a new mask to get it to seal. And uh, just aggravating. And I, then I'm afraid I'll wake Carol up when I'm messing around, you know. And of course, if you don't, haven't had any experience with that, it'd be best if you didn't. But uh, we'll, we'll skip down here. I won't read all of that. Well, start in verse 1. Or 2 Corinthians 12, 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. Do you know there were three heavens? I hear some people talk about seventh heaven. I don't know about that, I never saw that in the Bible. But there's a heaven word down here where the birds fly around, then there's another heaven where the planets are at, then there's another heaven, the cosmonauts from Russia got up to the, you know, they went up there, and they said, we didn't see God. <laughs> but the Americans, they seemed to think God was in it. The astronauts, you know. And they didn't see God because they didn't get up enough. They didn't make it to the third heaven. They're still in the second. They didn't get to the third heaven. But I'm planning on going to the third heaven where God's at. And now, are Christians going there or not? As the, uh, he already gave me the earnest of the Spirit in my spirit. God told me I'm going there. Especially through reading the Word of God. Isn't that the way it works or not? Verse 3, And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up to, to paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. In other words, I can't tell you all about it, but it was pretty great. <laughs> that's what he said. That's, that's my uh, Greek interpretation. You know, pretty good. Put it in the Greek. Verse 5, Of such a one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now some preacher today had that experience they'd get on TV and send some money yeah send some money that's what a lot of it's about that's good right there like that. it's the truth yeah verse 6 for though I would desire to glory I shall not be a fool he says it's foolish really we ought to be humble before God some people think they can tell God how things should be and they pray and say, now, Lord, this is what you ought to do. Well, we ought to say, if it's the Lord's will. When we pray in Jesus' name, that, in a sense, is what we're saying. Lord, if it's your will. But anyway, Paul has this experience. Uh, he, he gets to uh, go to the third heaven. He talks about it. We're going to get a body that's not going to die. We're going to get a much better body. Uh, Paul had some different feelings about things with uh, this. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having desired to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. In other words, I'm, I'd like to go to heaven. I'd go be with the Lord. Then he goes on, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And I had my a friend tell me the other day, I told him, you know, I'm 75. I don't know how long I'll live. None of us do. That's right, no matter what. Even if you're real young. We don't know, do we? No. We're in God's hands. But I was telling him, you know, I don't know how the Lord will long. He says, well, you'll probably be around as long as the Lord's got somebody for you to help. I thought that was pretty good. I thought that was pretty good. Amen. There's a lot of people who need a lot of help. You know how you can help them the most? Tell them about Jesus. And live like Jesus would have you live. And let them see that. Amen. That's just like your son there. You need to live right in front of him. Yeah. You need to take him to church. Yeah. You need to pray in your home and at meals and yeah. Isn't that the way we do? We never did ask Martin and Brian, do you guys want to go to church? No. We just got up and got dressed and everybody went. 
We didn't have a discussion. But you watch some of these commercials on TV, the kids run the home. The kids tell them, act like they're smarter than mom and dad. Well, if they are, they don't need you. Of course, I guess they do for a while. They can't talk, can't feed the bills. I'm going to tell you something else, though. You know, we've got a heavenly Father, and we need Him, too. Amen. We need Him. Hebrews uh, chapter 11 is another place I, I wanted to talk about, but um, let's see. I guess I better look at my notes here. Try not to have as many, so that helps me a little bit. But uh, but Paul did reveal a little bit about what heaven was about, didn't he? In some of his writings. Like I say, Paul was a tent maker, and when he wrote this epistle, he's living in Philippi with two other tent makers, Quill and Priscilla. And uh, so I'm sure they talked about, but I'm sure they talked about the Lord too. If you read the text, you'll find out they did. And uh, they tried to help other people know about the Lord. But you know, we're, we're not satisfied living in a tent. I want a better body. I want to get better. I don't want to... This tent's wearing out. Is your tent wearing out? Yeah, me too. Uh-huh. Well, sometimes it turns gray on top. And sometimes it falls out. Uh-huh. We, we, we go through the last part of Ecclesiastes tells you what it's like getting older. Uh, you know, a tent doesn't have any foundation, doesn't have roots. It's, it moves and, uh, you know, you can go here today and there tomorrow. And, isn't that the way a tent works? That's just a temporary thing. You know, down in our hearts there's a longing for security, comfort, and permanence. I may want to be secure. Well, we all do. Amen. And so that's why we believe the Lord's going to give us a better body. Kent can be decorated. Can you decorate your tent? Mm -hmm. well, imagine the ladies got up this morning decorated their tent. <laughs> now, I don't know about Jimmy. He didn't get up and shave. Yeah, I ain't shaved in a while. But I did. Not going to. Then I'll put some of that smell and stuff on. <laughs> Try to comb my hair, it was sticking everywhere. After I take a shower, my hair just sticks every which way. And then it usually sticks up in the back, I look like alfalfa. Little <laughs> yeah. so Carol says, Your hair's sticking up the back. And I didn't get my collar down on my coat, so she turned that down. It's a good thing I got her to keep an eye on me, I'd be a mess. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yes, it helps to have somebody else to help you. But then we can fix other people or help other people. And uh, we buy clothes. Don't we buy nice clothes? Amen. Of course, we got a few people there. They like to go get them at Goodwill. They get a better deal on them. <laughs> sometimes you get name brands at Goodwill. Mm -hmm. Or even a yard sale sometimes. You never know what you'll run into. But we try to make our tent as pretty as we can make it, don't we? It's handsome, as nice. And we can put a tent on some kind of foundation, but it's still not going to be permanent. Success may come, riches may come to our way. And, uh, but one day the stakes are going to be pulled up, aren't they? You're not going to take anything with you. You didn't bring anything in, the Bible says you're not going to take anything out. One thing I think we could take out if we could tell somebody how to get saved. Yeah. Paul said he's going to get to see him in heaven. That'd be quite a thrill, wouldn't it? To get to heaven and look around and see somebody you had a part in helping them get there. Yeah. And of course somebody says, well, how do I do that? Well, you need to pray that your loved ones and people you know get saved. Yeah. You need to live in a way that you give them a good example that Christianity is real. It's not something that's fake. And uh, when you get the opportunity, you ought to be telling them about how to go to heaven. A missionary uh, had traveled to Africa and he was burdened for the needs of the people. They wanted to get a clinic, a hospital built. And he came back and he talked to his friend that was a big businessman. 
And he'd, be, he'd been uh, over in Africa for 15 years as a missionary. And he came back and his friend greeted him, you know, and said, it's nice to see you. He said, uh, uh, what have you been doing? And he said, well, I've been in Africa for 15 years as a missionary. And uh, I've been over there ministering to the needs of the people and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And the man uh, said, oh, well, uh, what a fool. With your intellect and your ability, you could be rich. And he knew it, you know, and knew what he was. And uh, he said, what are you wasting your time with all those people for? And then the missionary tried to explain to him the need of a hospital over there. And the fellow took him and showed him all the buildings that he owned. And, and he said, uh, God didn't help me get any of that. And he said, uh, and God's not going to get a dime of my money. And uh, he kind of brushed the missionary off, you know. So the missionary leaves and the fellows, it was noon on a Saturday, and he stayed behind. He was going to finish up some of his book work. And he went to put his books in the fault, you know, big six-inch steel door. And he's got all kinds of stocks and bonds and money in there. And as he's putting it in there, he hears the door click. He's locked up in the safe. They didn't have much air left in there. It only lasts so long. Mm -hmm. And it's on the weekend. And he's beating on the door and screaming and yelling, but nobody's out there to hear him. Finally, he pulls out some of these drawers. You know, he had money and stuff in. And he's beating on the door. And... Uh, uh, a few days later, he comes to in the hospital. He said, how did I get here? Because he thought he was going to smother the death. And the nurse said, well, apparently when you were beating on the door, it set off an alarm and they came and rescued you. Well, you know, after that, the fellow calls the missionary back and he decides that he wasn't such a fool. And he says... How much do you need to build a hospital? Mm -hmm. You know, the Lord's got ways of yeah. working on people. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. Yeah. A lot of it depends on you. How stubborn right. mm -hmm. think we are. and how much you resist God. Yeah. But God will go a long ways to get you saved. Mm -hmm. But I think He also knows some of you won't get saved. Mm -hmm. And He maybe will let you know, he'll go so far and then that's it. Now, we don't know that, though. Yeah, I right. don't know who will get saved. So I'm not a Calvinist. I, <laughs> I just believe it's a whosoever will gospel. So I just tell everybody. <laughs> and the Lord's a sovereign. And God can work on people. That's right. I imagine some of you sitting here he's worked on. Oh, yeah. Or you wouldn't be here. Amen. Isn't that the truth? And uh, he's worked on me. And I, I was saved young, so I didn't get... And plus, I had a lot of history, alcohol problems in my family. My mom's second husband would get drunk and beat her. And I was a little kid seeing that. Last time we saw him, he was trying to murder us. Got us in the car going down the highway about 50, 60 miles an hour. Said, I'm going to take you out here to... He, he used to go around and collect junk and sell it, scrap metal. He said, uh, I'm going to take you out here to the junkyard and kill you. Me, my brother, and my mom. Mm -hmm. He's going down the road. My mom says, well, I'll just jump out. He said, well, maybe that'll kill you. <laughs> no. When we get to the junkyard, he gets out and starts to walk around the car to open the door to pull my mom out. I was sitting in the back seat and reached up and locked the door. He grabs a hold of the car door. He's hanging on the side of the car door trying to kick the window out. He's a big guy, like 6'3". He'd been in some fights and whipped two or three policemen before. But when he'd get drunk, he was mean. And uh, so he got thrown out across the dump there. 
And we'd lived in a, was, this was over in southern Illinois, we lived in a mobile home. And uh, my mom was going to get some clothes and we are going to leave, you know. Well, he, he had hitchhiked and got a ride. He was there and grabbed my mom again. She's laying in the middle of the street. Some guy sees her and goes and calls the police. Well, then they had us, they put us in jail that night to protect us. So I spent a night in the jail. The next day, a couple of policemen brought us back to Indiana. Stay with my grandparents. Now, that kind of turned me against alcohol. But yet I had uncles that were alcoholics. I wonder if my grandfather wasn't on my mother's side. And they drank that stuff. Oh, that tastes so good, make the awful faces. And I said, well, if it tastes so good, what are you making that face for? And they even had let me taste some of it. When I was a little kid. But I've never been drunk in my life. I've never done any illegal drugs. And I lived through the 60s, and, and I'm not like Clinton. He said he didn't inhale. <laughs> Smoked marijuana, but he didn't inhale. But I think he's been known as to tell a lie once in a while. He didn't have sex with that woman either. He got on TV and said it. And then they wonder why we don't respect politicians and people in authority. But you Christians need to be careful. If you don't live right, they're not going to respect you either. And they're not going to respect your God. So you need to try and live for the Lord. One fellow, he was 75 years old, muscle guy, you know. You know, anybody know who Debbie Drake is? Yeah. Who was the, the guy? Who was a guy at the same time? That was an exercise. Yeah. Jack Jack something. But anyway, this guy's 75, and he says, well, on my 100th birthday, I'm going to meet with a friend of mine up at a big fancy hotel in, in uh, Toronto, Canada, and uh, we're going to celebrate. He's 75, of course, he's all into health stuff, you know. But at 86, he got pneumonia and died. Mm. We don't know, do we? No. Better be careful when we start talking about we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're going to be able to do whatever God allows us to do. And that's all. But you know, we can't be content living in this body and this life. I want something better. Amen. And that, and that what it tells us here in these verses that we read. You know, I'm kind of limited in this body. Anybody here limited? I've gotten more limited as I've gotten older, but I've always been limited to a point. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now if you want to really study what your new body is going to be like, 1 Corinthians 15 tells you what the resurrection body is going to be like. That's right. And I'm not going to read the whole, there's like 58 verses, or 58 I believe it is. And uh, so I'm not going to read this whole chapter. But I want to read some of it to you and let you get an idea of uh, what your body's going to be like. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, go down to verse 43. 1 Corinthians 15, 43 says, It is sown in dishonor, is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Are we going to have a new powerful body? You know, some guys flex their muscles, boy, I'm powerful. You're not near as powerful as you will be. Uh -huh. And uh, then we can read a few more verses here. Go down to verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. That's pretty good. Isn't it? And then uh, I was going to skip all the way down to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. The rapture is going to take place. Some people will be caught up and they'll be changed on the way. Some of them will die and then when they're resurrected, they'll be go up with the ones that are uh, still alive, be caught up and they will be changed on the way up. But we'll be changed. Now verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
Is that pretty quick? Twinkle. At the last trump, I think that's Jesus' voice. Amen. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now we're corruptible now. Did your hair turn gray? Uh huh. Why not? Some of your body parts are wearing out. Yeah. Why? Uh huh. Knee replacements, hip replacements, lung, re there's all kinds of, it's amazing some of the things that man can do, but he can only do it because God allows him to do it. Amen. Even if they cut you open and do some of this stuff, it's got to take God for you to heal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm thankful for good doctors, and there are a lot of good Christian doctors. That's just a fact. Amen. And it'd be better if you had a Christian doctor. He'd probably pray for you while he's cutting on you. That's mm -hmm. right. And before and after. I, I wouldn't really want to be a doctor and have to cut somebody over. No. That'd be pretty yeah. stressful. Yeah. Well, let's see. I was reading the, down here. I don't know what verse got to. We got changed in verse 52 and 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, we're immortal. We won't die. Amen. You know, I know I'm going to die. If you know what? The, nobody died, there wouldn't be any graveyards. That's right. Nobody got sick, there wouldn't be any hospitals. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the sayings, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Are we going to get victory over death in the grave? Amen. If we're Christians? That's right. Verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Does Jesus make the difference? Without Him, you don't have anything. Then verse 58, this is my, if I guess if I had a life verse, this would be it. Because I don't have a lot of talent and I don't have a lot of ability, but I can just stay in there. That's about all I think I've accomplished in 75 years. And it says, therefore my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Maybe I can't preach as good as some people. Maybe I'm not as educated. But I can at least serve God. And just be faithful. And I thank the Lord God gave me a faithful wife. She's put up with me for 53 years. The 20th of July, yeah. 1968, we got married. Doesn't seem like it's been any time. Doesn't seem like it's been any We were in our early 20s when we got married. If the Lord's willing, we'll make it to 60 years. But notice I said, if the Lord's willing, and he's given us this many years. But you know, soon we're going to depart from for our heavenly temple. I'm going to get out of this tent. I'm going to a temple. And uh, there are a lot of verses we can use for this. Um, I want to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16. Hebrews chapter 11. That's the great faith chapter, isn't it? And I list all these people of faith. And the first ones, you know who they are. Adam and Abraham and Noah and Moses. And, but when you get down to the end, there were some that died terrible deaths living for God. That's right. And it says, what about the others? 
We might not get all the victories in this life, but we're going to get the victory in the end for sure. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off. I've never seen heaven, but God made me a promise, and I believe God's promise is going to be kept. I believe John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the promise. Isn't that a promise? Or John 14, He says, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And so we're reading here in Hebrews, and, and it goes on, he says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were, were strangers and pilgrims in this, on this earth. I'm just a pilgrim, stranger. I don't belong here. Matter of fact, uh, the more things that go on, the less I feel like I belong here as a Christian. When I watch the news and hear what's going on, it's terrible. Terrible. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from where they came out. Well, I'm living in a country, in the world. But I'm not tied to this world. I'm going to leave this world, going to something better. Isn't that right? From, uh, and truly, if they had been mindful of the, that country from which they came out, they might have been op- had opportunity to have returned. Well, I don't want to return. I want to get out of the tent and go to a temple and a better body. But now, being... De- they des- but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Is that what you desire? Are you tired of this world and the mess it's in? Wherefore, God is not a sh- uh, shame to be called the God, this their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. So he prepared you a city. And there are other verses I could give you. Second Timothy chapter four, verse six through eight. Paul is Paul's swan song. He said, "I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Hence, it is laid up for me a crown of righteousness." And uh, then in First John three two, it says, "Behold, now are the sons of, now behold now are we the sons of God? It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him." as He is. And then I already told you John 14 verses 1 through about 6 said, I go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And it has to do with what you believe about Jesus. And of course we've got a song, we're just pilgrims and strangers in a foreign land. And it's getting to feel more foreign. It used to be America, I think, was acted more Christian than it is now. But you know what it tells me? The devil knows his days are short. And he's really fighting hard to drag people down and to send them to hell and keep them from going to heaven. And he wants you to follow him, not the Lord. That's, that's where we're at. There's a song that says, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. If you can feel at home in this world, I'll tell you where you ought to feel it the most. At your house, where your family's at. That's about it. Like if I go out down to Coke when I was working for 40 years down there, when I'd come in to see my house, of course my wife and my boys were there. And that's the closest to heaven down here. So I thought it would be church. The home was started before the church. That's right. 
if you don't have good homes, you don't have a good church. That's the order. That's the way it works. Now let's all stand.